than we've been doing. Um, all right, so um, Ivy, you can type things in whenever you like. Um, let's see, and Warren and I, I guess we'll just have a conversation. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, we'll just have to do it. Okay, Warren, what was your impression of the reading? The, it's the, what's it called? The Williams, William James? Right, the will to believe. Yes. I started to read it late because I read the post and a part of your post caught me off guard because it says um, you don't have to read it, but you might want to think. Well, that was what? the other essay. What is pragmatism? Um, okay, so let me... If you have questions, you absolutely need to email me, right? You, yeah. you can't come to class unprepared. And so whatever it takes, I'm sitting on my computer and you can email me. So, okay, for Wednesday, the will to believe. Mm -hmm. And then optional colon, what is pragmatism? Ah, uh, yes. Okay, and I didn't put the what is pragmatism on. Now, if you had a question, you should have emailed me because mm -hmm. what this means is, oh, we don't have anything we have to read today. That was the way you interpreted it? For a second, but then I realized that that cannot be because I saw the two readings there. So I'm like, I, dif I disregarded it after a while. Okay, and you can always way. email me. Um, so how much of it did you read then? I got through the entire outline, and then when I... How about the essay? I did not get through all of the essay. I will be completely honest about that one. How much of it did you read? Not a lot. So how not much... Enough, not, not enough to have the productive conversations that you and I usually have. Okay. I can say that. Okay, so how much time did you actually take on the class? In the class. So we're supposed to have two hours of preparation for each hour of class. Did you spend two hours? No, I didn't. I did not spend right. two hours. Okay. So, um, well, it's all right. I mean, we'll we'll just talk about this. But I think if things keep breaking down like this, we're going to have to start having additional classes, right? Like we did before. Um, but we can start. Um, so here's the essay, it's 16 pages. So it's not, it's definitely within the time frame of two hour assignment. Um, but okay, so let's start with, what was your impression of reading the outline? At first, when I started to read it, I got a little confused, but then I realized it started to talk I realized how everything was starting to connect because last class, the last class session, we started to talk about faith a little bit in the last part when you were saying what faith is. And then here in part four, it says a defense of religious faith, not blind faith. I wanted to ask you, what exactly do, does that mean when I say not blind faith? Because faith in, in, in essence, I would say is sort of blind because it's not something you physically have proof of to have faith because okay we none of us have ever really seen god but we have faith that he exists so that would say what's the opposite you have something that's concrete and something that tangible and intangible that's what that's what i would put it at so what, when they say not blind faith and it says most faith is blind based on instinct alone. What exactly do they mean when they say not blind faith? So what's the opposite of not blind faith? Because to me, I would say most of it is blind in a sense because we are not necessarily seeing the tangible thing to say, okay, we believe in such a thing or we believe in so and so. Okay, so, um... Let's go back to, 
I mean, the, the way he sets the problem, that's the way he sets the problem, is that either there is a male God in the sky that doesn't function by scientific laws, or there are these scientific facts that absolutely function by necessary laws, right? Or high probabilities, right? Does that make sense? Yes. That is a completely white Western male post-enlightenment view of what the choices are. Does a Hindu think that it's that? No, a Hindu doesn't think God is a person at all, right? Mm -hmm. God is energy, the energy of the universe. Does, yes. a Buddhist, does a Buddhist think this way? No. No. Does a Confucian think this way? The great harmony? No. Does- um, They don't believe in a physical being. Right. They, they think of the universe. They think the universe is a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts right? And it's greater than humanity. And it, we are part of it. We evolved from it. And the sage, like the ancient sage, if you're wise, it means your, your mind is a microcosm of the macrocosm. So it's not a matter of believing it or not. It's a matter of recognizing it, recognize, right? So your senses give you all this data, but you can draw this conclusion that the natural world is all interconnected and that we evolved because it's ordered and we can understand that order to some extent. And so the degree to which we understand it, we ought to create a culture that is sustainable, that is in succinct, in, in uh, resonates with it, right? That respects it. Um, okay. so what would they say about our living now? Like how we operate now? It's because awful, Right? It's awful, right? We're at war against that. We're literally, right? Everything mm -hmm. we do violates good karma, right? And then, you know, in sports, it's very much that way. Because so, of the way it's developed, not because mm -hmm. actually having a healthy mind and a healthy body is really important, but of course it's gone way beyond that, right? Mm -hmm. So as it relates to that and the whole we living opposite to good karma and seeing that it is their way of living, are they saying they are technically not at fault as well because they are living the good and righteous ways in their eyes? Because they said um, it here, it says the truest hypothesis in science is what works best. And it says the truest hypothesis in religion is what works best. So in their eyes, they're doing what works. I think everyone is doing what they think works best. That's right. That's why I don't agree with this position, right? Exactly, exactly. So why, why do people think Trump is God's messenger? Go again. Why do people think Donald Trump is God's choice for? Because that side of those people think that's what works best. That's right. Because it's useful. Yes, but everyone will never come to that consensus. Not everyone will not have the same thing. So. It's just going to be a game of pointing finger. Oh, we're doing this and we're living in according to the good karma and you're not doing this. So it's just going to be at the end of the day, a finger blame game. Oh, you're not doing this right. You're not doing this not right. But fingers, it's power, right? It's going to turn into a power play. It's not just fingers. I mean, I wish it were just fingers, but... <laughs> But as a matter of fact, we all depend on each other. And mm -hmm. so people have power over other people because they need them. The people under I, them, right? Yes. I, I also, another thing across going the outline, I realized that 
between science and religion. He's trying to say there are there are more alike than we think. That's what I took from it because usually people would use science to pit it against religion, say, oh, science proves this and this disproves this. And then people who are religious are saying, okay, oh, the Bible says this. But here I think the two statements where he made, uh, made under, was it five A and B, which is the truest hypothesis. I think he's using that, well, from what I'm saying, what if we tried to use both of those together and see what would happen instead of saying science this or religion this? Because he basically says science and religion are the same thing. That's literally what he said here. Well, they have the same motive, mm -hmm. right? They have yes, a, that's, what, that's basically what I'm saying. They have the same motive. Uh, they're passional. They're based mm -hmm. on what you want. They have a different object right? I'm passionate about fact. I'm passionate about whatever it is. That's, I think that's very touchy. What, what I'm passionate about the word G-O-D. Okay, if you spell it Y-A-H, you know, I mean, what is the object? <laughs> what are you referring to, right? Um, and he does refer to that object as a man, like who said it was a man? <laughs> right. And when he talks about men proposing to women or women complaining about men, obviously it is a man that he's thinking of. Because what, whether he, you know, accepts the object or not, the object is powerful. And now you've already got women in a powerless position. Well, obviously that object is going to be a man. <laughs> exactly. Definitely. I mean, oh my God. He doesn't realize, he is not at all conscious of all the stuff that he's bringing with him into mm -hmm. this debate. But it isn't uh, just him, Warren. How it, long ago was, was all of this? Written? Well, actually, the other thing that really, uh, really amazes me is that it was in the 20th century. I mean, I think it was the early... Uh, Let's see, 1912, copyright, first edition, 1897. Okay, okay, this is really important. So this was during the Enlightenment. Obviously it was. It was during the Enlightenment. And, uh, okay. Um, so it was at that time when John Locke and the utilitarians and um, especially the empiricists, right? So Locke was an empiricist that brought in this concept of human rights, which was very anti-empirical, right? Uh, you know, at the state of nature, we're all free and equal and we all have a right to this and that. Well, what is the state of nature? Like it's mm -hmm. completely conceptual. So then the utilitarians came along and they said, no, let's just stick to the facts, right? And then people like John Stuart Mill said, your conscience, your sense of right and wrong is not innate. It's just all your associations, right? And so your idea of God would just be a matter of whatever associations you have, like what your parents said and then what they did and then what your preacher said and did it's it's every one of your experiences put into a heap and mm -hmm. some kid finds some pattern somewhere right yeah okay so he's saying uh william james is saying that you can tell that the climate of opinion among intellectuals is that God is completely anti-science, right? Um, he says every time some Harvard student uh, goes into being logical, they completely reject. It's a dead hypothesis for them, right? And um, so that's the, the climate on campus is that you're a believer or you're not, 
And all Mr. James is saying is that everyone's motivated by a desire to believe something. They have a will to believe, right? And so some have a will to believe that facts are all there is, that science is, is the, should be the only driving force in human motivation, right? But they have a will to believe that. Whereas the other side have a will to believe that there's a God and um, that there's more than science. That's just about all he says about God. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That there's more to science. There's immaterial reality. Um, and then in that outline, did you get to the second page? It was an outline in another essay he wrote about immortality. But he, again, his image of immortality is like an, a pipe organ where the, the body, the human body is the pipe organ, has all the pipes. But there's a spiritual reality that's the, the wind that blows through the pipes and makes the music right? And mm -hmm. so that's James's idea of what it would mean that there's a spiritual reality. And he's, he, you know, his segue into it is that our thoughts cause our thoughts, right? And we can start just living in this world of just thoughts. And so why does that have to be attached to our body, right? Does that make yes, sense? the part that you just said on the second page is, I think that says in number seven on the second page, it says spiritual insights depend on the brain in order to come into existence, but the brain is not the source of the first cause right. of right. the insights. The yeah. physical brain is, is the means through which spiritual reality is recognized. Right. Does that make mm. sense? Yes. Okay. So it's like a prism you have to have the sunshine going through it before you see the rainbow, right? Yes. Uh, and the keys of an organ release the air to get, okay. Now, again, that's very generic and it's not, I mean, it's non-material, but it's not like karma. Karma is, you know, about principles of the universe and how it fits together. All James is saying, well, is it's not data. <laughs> what the heck is it, right? Okay, now, um, let's see, let me, so that's the first thing is that, and it's very interesting to me, it's, the, it's during the height of the enlightenment, these debates are going on whether, and the scientists think we've got to give up religion because people who are religious are resisting science. And they're making- That's, that's, exactly, that's exactly what I was saying earlier, where we have the people who are religious, the way I said science and religion are oftentimes, one is used to pit against the other. So right. people who believe in science are saying, oh, religion is not so. And then people who are religious are saying, oh, science is just not so. Yes, and the Lyon College campus is really caught up in that dichotomy. Oh, does that make sense? Oh, yes, I, I didn't know that though. Okay, well, I mean, a lot of my students come to the class, come to my, world religion, world philosophies class with that dualism in their head. And mm. they say belief means to accept something without evidence, right? And so it's absolutely anti-science. It's anti-science, right? Yes. Okay. So um, let me just go over the... the Another question, Dr. McKinney. Yeah, go ahead. These, these philosophers that we've came across, all the strong head, all strong headed white men who believe men are superior, do you think any of them, because some of them speak, say they believe in one thing, but then their message says something differently if you really go deep into it. 
do you think any of them would conform or transform their belief to what society is directing itself into now? Well, one would hope. <laughs> okay. And that's, that's big because I like Aristotle, but he was sexist. And so you have to say if he were around now, well, in his day, he was cutting edge in his time. Yes. That's why I said if they, if they, if there were ever a chance where they are from the same realm or the same time period that they are from and they somehow survived and have the same cognitive functions and stuff, they're not deteriorated or anything, do you think they would stick harshly with what they believed from the very beginning? Or do you think the environment that they are in would somehow cause them to conform or see what is going on and accept it right they'd expand their mind they'd see what they hadn't seen they'd be able to recognize how they were blind right i mean you would yes. think about warren that's i would give them the benefit of the doubt so yeah. no I'm, I'm i'm not saying they won't i'm just trying to see what no no you, you that's think. i mean here's what happens warren as a matter of fact that i the reason why i think it's important to study is because these ideas still have impact. You know that, mm -hmm. right? You can tell that. But the people we read were cutting edge in their day, mm -hmm. right? In their day, yes. they beyond what was given. So the people you need to read today, the people who are analogous are the ones who point out Sexism is wrong. Racism is wrong. Uh, thinking non-binary sexual orientation is perverted is wrong. Mm -hmm. We know these things. And using science to destroy the environment without any limit is wrong, right? We know that. And so what the reason we should study this other stuff is it had such an impact in the way our culture got structured. And so we have to get beyond the structures we're living in and the, and the mindsets that are behind those structures. Does that make sense? Yes. And, and we have to also recognize that really, really smart people were really blind to the truth because cultural conditioning is powerful, but it doesn't define the truth, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so we went through that with slavery, right? Even Douglas accepted it, even Sojourner Truth accepted it until they didn't, right? And so that process, and it's a painful process of recognizing that you were blind, right? That's why I like teaching college. The whole point is that you're, you're evolved enough, like you're old enough to be able to look objectively at what you were raised with and to see, okay, here's what my parents got right and here's what they got wrong. But you do that in relationship to what do I think a healthy psyche and a healthy society moving forward where we need to go because in college you're teaching the future leaders right college is always just for it has never been the, the majority of citizens that have been able to go to college so everybody who goes is being programmed to lead right and when you study the history of ideas you study each one of those people, their ideas led the next generation forward. And so you have to think about, well, what ideas do we need now to go forward? And how, were, how was William James blind? Um, so he, he is a classic case of somebody 
who's completely saturated with this enlightenment optimism that it's never going to be problematic what science does. Nobody, nobody questions that, right? Mm -hmm. the, the whole, and it's never problematic. What the heck you mean by the word God, right? The only thing, the only hypothesis that's living is whether all there is is facts or whether there's some spiritual reality that you know goes above the facts that's it like oh my gosh um because what happened after he after james right what happened in the 20th century that these thinkers never ever ever would have thought that europe could degenerate into fascism i mean can you understand how William James it would have absolutely been incomprehensible to him that they could have devolved, that Europe would devolve like that. Not only that, but the Nazis were high tech guys. They were the science guys, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to be really good at science and technology to gas six million Jews, right? Yeah, I think I think I was watching a movie with all of that being reenacted. It was very highly science based, where they uh, formulated the gas and all that type of stuff. But and in the movie, they had, I think they had a, a female doctor was the one who was the head of the operation of the whole scientific gas area part of it. I don't remember the name of the movie. Though. Anyway, can you tell by reading this essay, they aren't anticipating that at all? Mm -hmm. No, not at all. Okay, and then that comes from John Stuart Mill. Remember when John Stuart Mill said that we're gonna create, we're gonna socially construct this world where everybody seeks higher pleasures. And we have a middle class, we have healthcare, and the, the way to do that is to make sure these people who've been raised like him to love the higher pleasures will structure the society so that every child will be conditioned to love the higher pleasures. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay, can you see how James um, really assumes some version of that he he's not questioning that right and then he's he, and the the issue like the living hypothesis is just shall we just go with science or can we include religion now if you remember john stuart mill said first of all that conscience uh, Bentham was a complete materialist, right? Whatever you think is good or evil or just or unjust is a result of your conditioning. But John Stuart Mill also said that we're going to structure this whole society on empathy with the golden rule because we have a natural instinct to preserve our fellow species. But also that every major religion has that as its foundation, right? he could go back to the Sermon on the Mount and say, it's basically Christianity. It shouldn't mm -hmm. conflict at all, right? Um, all right, so in his mind, that's that would be the union of faith and reason would be um, that your heart has to be in the right place and you have to have empathy and you have to forgive and you have to want a middle class. And if you if that's what you call religion, if that's what you think God wants, if that's when you pray to God, you come you come back to social engineering for for the higher pleasures. Fine. You know, that's what it should be. And again, they didn't take that as very problematic. <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. And James, I think he's got something like that in the back of his mind. Right. You can, we can move forward with science without God, if you like, 
but why don't some other people can believe in God? What the hell, right? Why do you have to disagree? Does that make sense? Yes. But the assumption is we all completely agree on where we're going and that we're evolving and that our science is, you know, leading us forward. Now, you could say, and there's God too, or, you know, and God allowed this to happen or go ahead, you know, no problem, no mm -hmm. problem. Okay, is that what happened, Warren? Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. what happened in the 20th century? Uh, no. We had two world wars, right? Mm -hmm. How did that happen? <laughs> That's a very good question. Ah, yeah. I think we need to find out how did that happen? Because somehow your ideas are wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now you remember what Freud said. He said, God is this daddy in the sky. Mm -hmm. That is when a little child, you know, worships his daddy and daddy is all powerful and daddy is all knowing. And then he finds out, oh, daddy isn't all powerful and not, oh, but there's a God, right? So God compensates for that. God is the big daddy in the sky. Mm -hmm. Well, William James, you know, he, again, he doesn't seem to care. Like, you can believe God's the big daddy in the sky, you know? He doesn't. Like, it's just kind of crazy. Uh, crazy right? back and forth. Then, remember Karl Marx? What did he think religion was? It was... When a society has a religion, you know that the labor is alienated. There's oppression because people cannot live a human life on this earth. So they project it into another mm. world, right? Yes. So for Marx, the whole religious construction, it's completely a social construction and it's compensation for being oppressed for living an unnecessarily degraded life, right? Yes. So Marx thought of it as a collective problem and a collective need, unsatisfied need, leads to invention of God and an afterlife, right? After, if I work my buns off now, I will get eternal life. Yes. And then... Freud was just God is the big daddy in the sky that somehow mm -hmm. is in control. The whole daddy system. All right. Now, yes. what happened? Well, yeah, well, go ahead. Um, it was a different question about the same stuff that we're dealing with. Because I find it was a question. I find it more that when I read this the material and I ask you questions and then we have conversations, that's when... I learned the most from it. I know. And I was looking at looking at page three of the 18 page um, document that you assigned us. Okay. It's page three about down, down again. There we are. It's a, it would be like the second paragraph where it begins says, does it not seem that one? It says, does it not seem preposterous on the very face of it to talk of our opinions being modified by that will? Can or will either help or hinder our intellect in its per perceptions of truth? Can we, by just willing it, believe that Abraham Lincoln's existence is a myth? And it goes on and on. My question is that the first part, does this seem as if he's questioning the use of free will here? Because when he says modifiable at will, he, is he saying that, oh, um, that because we have free will and we will it so we can believe whatever we feel to believe? Because well, he does, he, he moves to say about the thing with Abraham Lincoln. I mean, Existence the thing that's is so interesting is his examples stack the deck, right? So yes. his examples are about absolute data points. Did Abraham Lincoln live? are i i'm 
you know, I have rheumatism in bed. Can mm -hmm. I believe I'm healthy? Yes, or, and the sum of two yeah, one dollar bills in our pocket. What about, I mean, you know, that's not the problematic example. Mm -hmm. The problematic examples are: Can I believe that uh, fossil fuel billionaires really have the human good at heart? Mm -hmm. Can I believe that Trump really is God's messenger? Yeah. So yeah. these points that he use are, are frivolous. That well, they're data points. The yes. things that you the things you really got to worry about are beliefs about good and evil, justice mm -hmm. and injustice. Right? And I mean, there's none of that right there. No, he doesn't. Exactly. Exactly. He doesn't. And he Because I've seen I've seen interviews lately where people still believe that Donald Trump is the president. Like people wholeheartedly, there's a guy who wholeheartedly believes that Trump is still the president of the United States to this well, very day. Okay, Warren, that's to me, that's a totally different issue. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, I was just using it to, because when he said about the Abraham Lincoln. No, that's right. Myth, yeah, that's right. No, no. There's just the mm -hmm. level of irrationality people are capable yes. of. He was completely ignorant of that. The Enlightenment never thought people would not accept facts, right? Ever. But this one is that he didn't think belief, the will to believe could get corrupted by what people will to believe about justice and injustice and good and evil and whether to go to war or not, right? Because they really thought war would become dated. Mm -hmm. I mean, war is, but what you have to figure out is what is there in that theory that would allow for what happened to happen? That's why I like teaching philosophy is because when I read that stuff, I saw right away, oh my God, like, He's not he, like he's stacked the deck. He's got such a limited worldview in what mm -hmm. he starts with. And he's talking at Harvard to Harvard students. These are the people that led the country when it went into World War I. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is, now we see the problem. So Warren, I really like to talk to you in some sense. You could do it without even reading the stuff, mm -hmm. but you know, it helps if you read it. You do need to, when you read it, you, you have to let your mind just sink in. What is his worldview? And then you compare it to these other ones or you compare it to what's happened and you go, ah! Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so that you have to go though, don't you? Yes, because I actually I have an exam that I have to take. I'm so sorry, woman. No, it's okay. It's okay. But it's fun to talk to you. We could talk for a long time about all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Um. So, if you would you ever be okay with us having some extra classes, just because of the way things are breaking down all the time? Um, I would not have a problem with it, but the, I'm not, I can't make the promise to say I will be able to attend because of my schedule. Are, I, you, I, are you busy from eight to 10 at night on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday? I mean, again, you probably don't want to, but Thursdays. You, Thursday night, eight to 10. Thursday, this coming Thursday? Well, in general, do you have things scheduled? Um, sometimes I'm either traveling or I have practice because we still have, because I have work, school and practice and I still have the assignments. So I usually take the night times to do those. Right. And then we, we, How late I have, does your practice? Huh? How late does your practice go? It depends on the, the weather. Because sometimes it rains and then because we have other teams, sometimes we have to schedule it down to later in the night or earlier in the day. Well, anyway, I do you ever have time from 8 to 10 at night on a Thursday? Sometimes I do.
Sometimes I do. Sometimes. I'm not gonna. I, I, the thing. The thing is. The thing is. I don't want to say yes and then not be able to live up to that commitment because I'm not that type of person. I don't want to tell you yes and then I'm I, not there. That's why. Um. Because, I said I would not be opposed to it. Okay, I would just try to arrange things for the three of us. Because obviously arranging it the way we do isn't working very well. So, <laughs> so arranging it for then in addition or something. But anyway, we already have an additional class each week. So that's good. But I do think like you have a mind for this. And I think you understand why it's important. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yes. And so it would be nice to engage. Um, you know, when I'm when I live on campus, I was always in my office all the time, like till midnight. And so, but not very many students ever came. It was kind of sad because I thought that's what you pay for is yeah. you know being able to really dig deep. But anyway, so I will see you uh next time. Yeah, I think most of where my reasoning comes from. I would I would want to say it's genetics from like my father's side because he did his degree in theology. That's what he studied. So I think most of what he thinks about or how he thinks, that's how I am. Right. It's just that I think you need to to read the Western intellectual tradition, right? To understand the society you're in. Yes. And also the way that we need to change or expand our view, view of God, because this view of God is going to get us straight to the death of life on earth because it doesn't make any distinction. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get it must be God's will or I have a will to believe it's God's will that this is Armageddon. And what could Mr. James say? He did not consider that that would be possible, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. This is important. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, again, you're late. You're probably late to your next thing. Yeah. Um, I have an exam that I'm going to take now. So I will see you on Friday. So it was nice to talk to you, Warren. Always a pleasure. Bye-bye.